Welcome to Charmed Life, a radio show discussing spirituality, magic, and the unconditional love of the universe. Thanks for tuning in. And I'm your host, Trisha Carr. Thank you for joining me today. If it's your first time joining, I would love to invite you to like, subscribe, share, comment, and review on the various ways that you can catch this program in the archives. And as what I mean by that is, you know, this is actually broadcast live. This is a live broadcasted podcast. A lot of casting happening here. We're live casting. We're casting spells. No, we're not. We're not. We're not casting spells. They don't really work. Anyway, uh, you can watch it live every week at 11 a.m. Pacific on ubnradio.com channel one because we do broadcast live from the Universal Broadcasting Network studios in Hollywood, California. And of course, on any of my social media platforms, well, Facebook and Twitter and Periscope. And you can find that by searching at Trisha Carr Charm or at Charmed Life 1111. I have a Facebook group that you could join so that you can get the notifications about it too. And you can find that at facebook.com slash slash groups, slash charmed life love. Did I say that right? Charmed life love. Yeah, I did. Okay. (laughs) And then also those archives you can find on iTunes, on um, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, however you receive your podcasting pleasure. And you can just search Charmed Life with Trisha Carr. So I hope you will, again, review, like, subscribe, share, because that helps me so much. And of course, you're joining your life in a light, in a very intentional way, contributing to this experience and I appreciate it so much. Additionally, I have youtube.com slash Trisha Carr. In both of those feeds, the YouTube and the podcast feeds, I offer different kinds of additional content. On my YouTube channel, you'll see the video of this podcast or live broadcast every single week. And then I'm also posting meditations and different kinds of shorter teaching. So please do go and check it out. I would love it so much. And hello to Jarvis Essex, my producer. I got you when you're taking a bite again. <laughs> <laughs> and you got it. This time you got a peach. Last month he was last month. Last week he was eating a plum. Yes. And, and he's, he's all about the stone fruits. You listened about the seasonality. I did. <laughs> still, still, I'm vamping here, I'm vamping here, and you still you haven't swallowed it yet because <laughs> you're <Sorry>. laughing. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for making this show beautiful. You're welcome. High vibrational and always contributing your healing. Jarvis is a healer, y'all. He's an empath. He's a healer. Uh, and I, I can't wait to have him on the show as a proper guest. You're going to do it, right? <laughs> okay, yes. Listen to him. He acts like I'm twisting his arm. I'm going to break his leg. Uh, All right. Yes. It's coming up soon. Mm-hmm. People are asking for it, Jarvis. <laughs> And if you so, if you're new listening, you uh, don't get to see Jarvis's beautiful face today, but someday you will. And I hope you will. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for the Jarvis reveal. <laughs> we have fun. Okay. Today is a different kind of a show. Normally I have guests on and I'm doing channeled messages and all that kind of stuff. And next week I am going back, I'll be heading back into a season of having guests on. I do these, I get to this period where spirits like, okay, you need to just do some shows solo. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. So the last few episodes I have been sharing some channeled messages about some pretty uh, deep rooted topics. And in, in my opinion, they are. This week, I'm going to discuss animal communication. And so I am a medium. I am an animal communicator, an intuitive, intuitive counselor, teacher, spiritual teacher and channel and all that kind of stuff. And one of my primary missions, one of my goals as all of those things or just as my sole mission on this planet is as a prophet for Gaia. And what that means is not like a fortune teller or something like that. I I just I really have a kind of affinity for the word prophet, meaning teacher and also meaning servant. And so Gaia, you know, the fifth dimensional, the spiritual consciousness, the archangelic consciousness of our mother earth and all of her inhabitants. That also includes the very sensitive humans who are having a similar kind of mission to work with ascension, basically, helping others, whether they are animals and nature, the natural aspects of this world, or with other humans, you know, basically what we call light workers and way showers. And all of those people are very much attuned to the energy of Gaia, of the planet. And so part of what I do in this, all of this work that I do is I work with people and their animals with 
in, in communicating telepathically with them so that we can understand the perspective of that animal. That includes also actually animal mediumship. So when your animal has passed, we connect with them to be able to bring through messages of healing and comfort and also really powerful guidance because animals are very advanced spiritually, generally speaking, compared to humans. And that is because of their affinity, their their energetic attunement naturally to Gaia. Gaia being, again, the spiritual consciousness, how we refer to the spiritual consciousness of Mother Earth. Mother Earth, or Gaia, is actually a consciousness or a being of light in the order of the Archangelic. And so basically, this is a very high spiritual guide for absolutely everyone, every single person who is existing on this planet, and every every animal and every plant and so forth. Gaia is a very important spirit guide for you. And so this is a part of my mission. And I do this in one-on-one services, and I'm actually beginning a program next week. There's just one week if you want to register, and we'll talk about that a little bit later real briefly. And But I'm going to be teaching a four-week program. It's uh, a coaching program, too, for people who to practice activating the gift of interspecies telepathy. And I'm writing a book on the topic from about, about my experiences communicating with animals and nature, and all of the profound lessons, the deep spiritual content I've received from animals and from nature. And so when I say nature, there's experiences I've had with trees and plants and bodies of water and also, you know, like butterflies. Because we think of animals, we think of the dogs and the cats and maybe the birds. I have birds. <laughs> and and that's those those guides, those family members are very, very important in our in our growth here <clears throat> and in our purpose and our mission here. Excuse me. <clears throat> no, there we go. Clear my throat. And so I wanted to share some of that book with you today because this is, I think, a really I I, I put a lot of obviously intention and attention into this and I would love to welcome folks to open your hearts and receive this and if you are someone who totally gets animal communication and maybe are practicing this gift yourself or if you're someone who's curious and maybe you do some other you have some other kind of spiritual practices that don't yet include this intentional communication directly with animals and nature or if you are just curious maybe even skeptical I hope that this share of my book will activate something in you that is inspiring. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the show sharing some of that information. And if we have time, we will take some calls, 323-524-2599. So you can hang on, hang tight if you like. You don't have to call in just yet, but we'll open the lines up in a little bit, 323-524-2599. Well, the lines are open. You could call in and hang out because you can hear the show as you're on hold. <laughs> Take a sip while I get into the energy of this book that is still in the offing. Part of the reason that it is partially composed, partially written, is because there, you know, there are basically the higher self holds off experiences so that you can have your full will gathered into it. All of the lessons that you are intended, all of the character that you intend to be before you experience something. This is why we actually have the experience of time is because the higher self is organizing it for us, holding things off and bringing things in for us because it holds the treasure of the purest of our intention, the purest of our purpose. And part of that is actually this upcoming program that I'm teaching starting next week, the four-week program on animal communication. I've taught tons and tons of courses on spirituality and I haven't taught a full-length course on animal communication yet I've taught classes here and there and I I help people with it one-on-one in my sessions but this has been a long time coming and so I'm going to share with you now my book called animals are who's to what animals teach me about life love and the universe and in case you didn't it's a kind of funny way it's a little quirky animals are who's h W-H-O, plural. The reason the title came about because when my husband and I were very early on in our 
courtship, dating. We had just started dating. I'll just say that. We've been together almost 15 years now, and we had just started dating a couple months in or something like that. And he was going to the zoo with his family. Some family were coming into town, and they were going to the zoo together. And so I told him, I said, hey, will you say hi to the animals? When you when you see the animals, will you say hi to each of them? And he, you know, this was before. It's been just two months. And actually, I wasn't open to animal communication in this intentional way. I didn't know anything about it as, you know, to the degree that I do now in a, in a sort of conscious way. I've always been commu- communicating with animals telepathically and spiritually. I just didn't know it, you know. And that's because, you know, conditioning kind of puts these filters on and we're, we, we are kind of, we forget some, the way that we actually connect spiritually in a very intentional way. And so, he was like, would you say hi to them? He's kind of like, he thought it was cute, thought it was endearing, but he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I was like, well, whoever you see, who, whoever, you, he's like, which ones? And I'm like, whoever you see, like, you know, whoever you come across and you see them, just say, say hello to them for me. And he's like, who? And I was like, yeah, whoever you see, which, you know, the animals that you see, whoever you meet, just say hi. And he's like, well, that's funny. And I was like, why? And he's like, well, I mean, people usually refer to animals as it and what and I just kind of looked at him and I said well animals are who's too <laughs> and he, I think he fell in love with me in that moment <laughs> I'll just be honest he thought it was adorable but it actually really like kind of struck him in his heart like of course they are you know he's always loved animals and so that's the reference here to the title of this book animals are who's too what animals teach me about life love and the universe He'll let you know. He'll let you know. This is what the veterinarian told me when I asked about my sweet Aramis, my cat of almost 16 years. Aramis, whom I often called Ami for short, had been failing in health for a few months. How long am I supposed to let him suffer? This was my question, the one that I asked of the medical doctor. This veterinarian was neither a holistic practitioner nor a metaphysical healer of any kind. This veterinarian was a traditional Western medical doctor who, up to this point, had given me purely medical advice. How can that be the answer? That's not scientific. You're a doctor. How can that be your answer? These words came forth more as despair than challenge. I was in pain. I knew that I was going to have to say goodbye to my Ami, but what my heart could hardly tolerate was his suffering. Aramis's dying seemed more painful for me than his death could possibly be. The veterinarian empathized with silence and presence. I appreciated her care and silently returned empathy for the fact that She has a life dedicated to countless moments just like this one. The decline of Aramis's health had accelerated in the recent days and weeks. However, we were at a screaming standstill of suffering. He was eating and drinking, although not a lot, and moving around, also not a lot. These are the indicators that we, animal caregivers, are told will be the harbingers that it is time. Time to make that decision that we make. It's a Sophie's choice kind of responsibility. Our hearts can hardly tolerate too soon or too late. In addition to this veterinarian, I had heard he'll let you know from my second and third opinion veterinarians and from holistic pet store employees. I stood at the counter of a pet, of this pet store after... A kind-hearted, 20-something employee had helped me to find a food supplement that intended to help Aramis put on some weight. At checkout, I broke down into tears and asked this sweet clerk, Am I supposed to just watch him starve to death? His colleague approached in a show of support, but they were both at a loss of how to respond. They advised me to come back the next morning and ask the store owner. As it turned out, Aramis did let me know. I had spent the night waking up every half an hour to check on him. At one point, I found him crumpled in an unusual position on the bathroom floor, 
the tile a couple of feet away from his litter box. As I reached for him, my wish was that this was his last moment. I hoped that I would cradle him in my arms as we made eye contact, and he would peacefully pass. His suffering would be over, and I would not have had to make that choice. That did not happen. I cradled Ami for a few minutes, feeling his warm, emaciated body. Then I placed him on the bath net, bath mat and pulled down some towels for me to lie next to him. The next day, he was still barely eating and drinking and barely moving. Is it now? I can't tell. About midday, once again, I cradled Aramis in my arms, this time to feed him some water with a syringe. As weak as he was, Aramis shook his head hard, rejecting my offer. Then... He looked into my face. His pupils were extremely dilated because he had very poor vision due to a brain lesion. However, Ami gave me the look that I had silently begged for the night before. No more. It is time, is what I felt my Ami say. That's the opening part of the book. Obviously, I'm reliving it a bit. And so I pause for a second to take a breath. And as I lead into the next section, and how I've written this book and how I teach in general is to really try to ground the concepts that we feel are very mystical and esoteric. Because I truly believe that spirituality isn't esoteric. And if it's mystical, It's mystical in an order to inspire us and to connect us to that bliss and to the truth of who we are. And the reason why I believe that any lesson of spirit can be grounded into the understanding of the below, you know, as above, so below, something that is earthly, something that is physical. I believe that this is how every spiritual concept is presented. Because if I were God... (laughs) <laughs> if I were a perfect parent, I wouldn't hide truth from my child. I would be showing it to them in every way that I could. I would be tricking them into understanding it. I would be sneaking it into their every day. I would be doing whatever I could to present it. And so when I teach or when I'm learning even, I look for the evidences and the explanations in the now, in the here, in the physical because if I, if I can't connect to it in that way, then I don't believe I'm ready to understand it. And I'm certainly not ready to teach it. And so I set up and I, the, the book with that share because I know that people who would be interested in it have probably experienced this because they have animal family and they have probably experienced loss. And so I'll lead into the next section, which is called, What is Animal? and nature communication. How did I feel Aramis say something to me? Was it just picking up on physical cues? Surprisingly, these are questions that simply did not arise in me in that moment. Everyone who said he'll let you know was correct. I had no doubt that I felt Aramis' statement. I understood it as clearly as hearing any statement with my physical ears from a human. Is telepathy, is telepathy an esoteric phenomenon? With what kind of regularity can it occur? How is it possible? And even if telepathy is possible, do animals have a level of consciousness that corresponds to the human consciousness so that we could engage in profound communication? I know that many of you are reading this because you have a belief that humans and animals have relationships that reach to the level of the soul. I know that you feel the power of being composed of Earth herself. Even if you think you are reading this as a skeptic, you are attracted to it because you have a desire and a knowing that we experience love with animals and nature in a manner that is complete, thorough, nuanced, and intelligent. In this book, I hope to help to give you permission. Excuse me. In this book, I hope to help you give yourself permission to live these truths. 
I learned these truths from animals, trees, insects, minerals, and elements themselves. Honest to God. And so what is animal and nature communication? To answer that, allow me to assert that we are energy. Beginning with Einstein, physics has assured us that this solidity is a mirage. The essential stuff of the universe is non-stuff. Deepak Chopra. Everything that can and cannot be perceived with the physical senses is made up of energy. This is probably not news to anyone who remembers a bit from high school science class, listens to spiritual teachers like Deepak Chopra, or has a cursory understanding of physics. But perhaps many do not daily think about this concept. For me, deeply understanding that we are energy catalyzed a great shift in my perspective, a shift from experiencing my being as detached and inert in a world of random discord to a knowing that I am composed of inspired, fluid, and pure creativity. And all that, all that things and, excuse me, and all that all things and people are one energy, and that is paramount to this reality. In essence, continuing to deepen my understanding of the concept that the universe is made of energy has become the basis of my relationship with animals and nature, with myself and everyone and everything with which I come into contact. How this concept, that everything, one, is energy, helps to answer the question, what is animal and nature communication? And it can be discovered in another one of Deepak Chopra's quotes. Where there is energy, there is information. Deepak Chopra. In short, animal and nature communication is receiving the information contained in an energy collection that is being expressed as an animal or an element of nature. What I know as my cat Aramis is a collection of energy. When Aramis and I shared affection, laughs, and even mundane communication like please feed me, we were exchanging information from the energy source we each identified as the self. Pretty simple, huh? But there is more to it than this, than the surface kind of information. We, as in everyone and thing, are consistently exchanging volumes of subtle information with one another, telepathically or energetically. So the next obvious question is, how can you intentionally receive the more subtle, energetic information? A practical example of how we receive information from energy is the radio. Less than 200 years ago, in 1820, scientists began harnessing electromagnetic waves with the intent of wireless telephony. Just shy of a century later, the world experienced the first public broadcast, radio broadcast. In times and in cultures preceding that sci- the scientific advent of radio communication, had someone suggested that one could throw one's voice across the world in an instant, they may have been hunted down like a witch and tried for blasphemy. For more than a century now, we have been, actu- we have been casually flipping on the radio, and a DJ speaks to us in nearly real time to introduce a message from another person whose voice is coming to us from the past via what we now call a recording. Instantaneous, remote communication is now common and practical. And we aren't even talking about the internet yet. So is it so difficult to accept that Aramis sent me a subtle energetic message? Perhaps this practice will be mainstream very soon. Perhaps soon science will be able to help us believe in telepathy. But why wait for someone else to give you permission to engage in a part of existence that is fulfilling if you can access it now? A miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love. Marianne Williamson Our perception has dramatically shifted from the gripping fear of witches throwing their voices to easily connecting with fellow humans. We share art, ideas, cultural experiences, and, to be sure, all of the darker aspects of the human expression every day through methods of electronic communication. Did we invent it? Not truly. Electromagnetic waves always existed. Scientists may simply, maybe not so simply, learned how to allow us intentional engagement through radio waves. It's a miracle. And with that, I think it would be good to take a break. Jarvis, 
and we'll share with you just a message about my upcoming program, and I'll be right back with you on the other side. Hey, Charmed Life listeners, it's Trisha Carr. I know many of you are passionate about animals and nature, and so I want to invite you to check out my upcoming animal communication four-week education and coaching program. This is for all levels of development. It's for the open-hearted animal lover and for anyone who is interested in developing the ability of interspecies telepathic communication. My animal communication four-week program starts the last week of July. Classes, activations, group meditations, supplemental materials, everything is offered online, including the live, personal, and group coaching, so you can join from wherever you live. We'll be covering a wide range of topics that concern multidimensional connection with animals and nature, including learning how to speak to and hear from your beloved animal family, animal mediumship, communicating with and receiving divine messages from nature's elements such as trees, bodies of water, wild animals and more, spirit animals and totems, animal spirit guides, and how to give professional animal communication and mediumship sessions. To read more about the program and to register, go to trishacarcharm.com slash animal hyphen communication. This live online program starts soon, so check it out now trishacarcharm.com slash animal hyphen communication. And we're back. Thank you for tuning in. Today we are talking about animal communication. I am sharing excerpt from my book, Animals Are Who's Too, What Animals Teach Me About Life, Love, and the Universe. Experiences that I have learned from animals, from nature, from the connection of interspecies telepathic communication. Actually, interspecies is maybe not exactly the most perfect way when we're talking about talking to a tree. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> That's how we are. So I'll get back into the book to preface it. The next quote that I have is actually from a, a person who I had on my show, oh gosh, it, it, when, in 2017, I think. Her name is Natalie Gianelli, and she is a channel. She is a spirit channel. She channels a, a consciousness named Dr. James Peebles, who lived in 1822 to 1922. He, Dr. Peebles was a holistic doctor, well ahead of his time, as we say. Not that anyone could actually be ahead of their time. But he is a very uh, a, a fantastic, help, helpful guide. And Natalie Gianelli, she actually con- she, uh, does the, uh, um, what you call it, a trans channeling of Dr. Peebles. So she actually brings through his actual personality. And she also does conscious channeling, which is um, where she's just listening. It's sort of, it's like mediumship. So she's listening to Dr. Peebles. Someone asks a question. Dr. Peebles is basically right there in her ear, giving her the answers. And that's pretty cool. He says, I, I've heard, I remember Natalie saying that he says, Dr. Peebles says he travels with a band of angels. <laughs> and so it's basically, so I think sometimes those band of angels are informing Dr. Peebles and Dr. Peebles is informing Natalie and then she's being the mouthpiece. So this quote is actually from a video. Uh, a filmmaker named Kevin Aguilar was doing this really long documentary in, in depth uh, questioning of many spiritual truths of Dr. Peebles as channeled by Natalie Gianelli. And so Kevin asks, in your opinion, what is the most accurate religion or the one that comes closest to the truth? And the answer is, from Dr. Peebles as channeled by Natalie Gianelli, if there were one religion that is closest to the truth, the very powerful aspects of the receptive levels of science would be the most accurate. For indeed, my infant, the action of science is a constant state of wonderment. This makes it most powerfully close to the truth. So to me, Dr. Peebles' answer is, science is the best religion. (laughs) And I kind of agree. And so I'm going to go ahead forward with the, uh, the book. Well, actually, I should say religion. I 
think that Dr. Peebles and how I am understanding religion to be basically a set of beliefs that are, in a lot of cases, contributed to one's experience from the outside. Of course, we all have sets of beliefs that are native. That is the personal religion or the personal set of beliefs. And so this is this is what I'm referring to and what I believe Dr. Peebles is referring to when he refers to science as a religion and one that is very powerful and close to the truth of how the universe operates. And so I continue with the book. I am not a scientist, let alone a physicist. I embrace a somewhat popular modern identity of being spiritual but not religious. More to the point, I am a creative, a healing artist, as I identify. However, I am inspired by science and I find it useful in the process of building beliefs. Beliefs are structures we use to allow experience. Intentionally building that structure is the key to living a freely expressed life. Accepting by default and without, excuse me, accepting by default and without review socially imposed beliefs stunts experience. And we all do it. Therefore, I like to use science as well as other schools of thought to help me be me. I like to let me rule me. I trust myself to have my best interest at heart. Who else has a pure motivation? The love that I feel for animals and nature outweighs anyone else's fear-based beliefs about what is possible to share with them. The love that Ami and I shared, indeed share, broke down old beliefs because that love was just too big for those constraints. And so... I do look to science for inspiration, for a way to help me align intellectually with what I feel in my heart. You could say I dabble in consuming the works of quantum physicists to the degree to which I am able to digest them. Quantum physics sparks in me a drive for metaphysical exploration. To me, these two are complementary. For example, my, my understanding of quantum entanglement leads directly into the feeling of my practice of telepathy. Quantum entanglement is, is simply stated, it's when two particles act together in an entangled system. This means that they behave like they are one object, even though they are physically apart. It suggests that space is just the construct that gives the illusion that there are separate objects. Fascinating. As an artist, I'm inspired to hear quantum entanglement that, in, I'm, I'm in, excuse me, as an artist, I am inspired to hear in quantum entanglement that separation of any kind is an illusion. Therefore, it is easy to receive information from another because the other is actually one with myself. Telepathic communication is a natural state of exchange. Energetic unity is more pure than verbal communication. I would like it if you could help more humans understand that they can turn on this communication. Mother Earth will be healthier when humans learn this. That is a quote from Nalu, a cat that I once worked with. Telepathy is our, as in us humans, first language. Parents and babies communicate telepathically. If asked, most parents would rationalize their understanding of their baby by assuming that they have memorized facial expressions or tones and patterns of cries. This rationalization is prompted by an unexamined, externally imposed belief about what is possible. It is true that a baby's brain begins to learn verbal language from as early a stage as possible. However, Telepathy, a more subtle method of communication, is the basis for the exchange of information between baby and parent. As verbal and physical communication is emphasized, the child de-emphasizes telepathic communication in favor of adapting to the family and the social group. After all, as children, we, for, we are dependent upon our relationships with others for survival. In short, we humans forget that we communicate telepathically. Another time we experience heightened telepathic ability is when we are in the early stages of a romantic love relationship. As with our newborn, your intention is dialed into understanding your new partner. 
While it may be an exhilarating time, the beginning of a relationship leaves you feeling vulnerable and scared. Mating, like parenting, triggers primal responses. In a new romantic relationship, there is a palpable urgency to understand one another so as to hasten the completion or the dissolution of the bond. We finish each other's sentences is a classic milestone for a new relationship. In both situations, of either parenting or partnering, people may not be aware that they're communicating telepathically, but the need to understand is so prioritized that the subtle ability functions without their conscious awareness. Birth, love, and death, these experiences that are so impactful that they can affect existential questioning. I am grateful to my sweet Aramis for using his departure to crack me open to the experience of more of my own truth. When a person is experiencing a period of higher than normal function with, of telepathy, the biggest threat to that flow is fear. A mother's worry about her sick child causes her to feel helpless and disconnected from understanding, understanding what her baby needs. A partner fearing that his new relationship may fall apart drives him to a state of panic and projection. Fear takes a sharp turn away from trust and love. Love is the frequency upon which true connection travels. How do you communicate telepathically? Naturally, you're wondering how I went from a spontaneous telepathic event with Aramis to, a re to reliably using telepathy. I offer a two-part answer. First, I'll explain the specifics about the way the information comes to me. I receive information from animals in nature in the form of feelings, pictures in my mind's eye, and what I translate into speech, again, in my mind. I do not hear voices with my physical ears. For example, when you remember a conversation you had yesterday, you conjure the setting, the dialogue, the feelings associated with the encounter. This is similar to the experience, except it doesn't feel like a memory. It feels as though I am receiving a new transmission. I was surprised by the new, this new feeling of a sort of silent listening the first time I intentionally telepathically spoke with an animal as an adult. I say that because I spoke intentionally with animals as a child. The information came into my, mind's, into my mind in a literary voice that was not my own. It did not feel like a memory, nor did it feel like imagination. That feeling is what convinced me that I wasn't just making it up because it was starkly different. As a matter of fact, the information I received in that first intentional conversation was contrary to my biased hope for the situation at hand. So the story that I'm referring to here is actually detailed in an upcoming chapter of the book, and that chapter is called Life-Changing Strangers, in which I speak about this feral cat who I was helping. And as a side, you can actually see a, a video on my YouTube channel that I recently posted where I explained this experience. And so you could go find that at youtube.com slash Trisha Carr. And the title of the video is My First Experience with Animal Communication Saved a Cat's Life. Something to that effect. It's just a few weeks ago as this broadcast is uh, going out live today. And back to the book. Here is the second part of my answer about my process of engaging in telepathy. Before I begin a telepathic conversation, I relax, and I do a full mini or micro meditation as time permits. This is key to understanding how I have grown into a fluent telepath and to how you may also do so if you choose. Allow me to explain what I think is happening on an energetic and perhaps a scientific level. I, to give, I intend to give you tools that may allow you to expand your beliefs to match the love in your heart. Using the example of the radio as an overlay, it is fairly easy to deduce a similar process occurring with brain waves, specifically gamma brain waves. Brain waves are synchronized electrical pulses from neurons communicating with each other. There are four basic types of brain waves delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. These bands of frequency occur from deep sleep to wakefulness. Beta brain waves emit ba during basic wakefulness, and above beta is the fastest documented brain wave frequency called gamma. In 2004, scientific studies were conducted with Tibetan monks who were well experienced in meditation, as well as novice meditators. 
As the monks be- as the monks meditated upon the focus of objective compassion, their brain activity began to coincide and harmonize. Remember how earlier I discussed that space is an illusion and that in truth everything and everyone is a unified sea of energy? The frequency rate of this unified neural activity was that of gamma brain waves. In short, the study revealed an association of gamma brain waves and the experience of unity consciousness. Additionally, the study showed that reaching the state of brain activity is more easily and reliably achieved with training. Like teacher always said, practice makes perfect. Essentially, when I telepathically communicate, I tune my brain wave radio dial to what I like to call the shared signal. Then, I call out to the animal or element of nature with my intention. And my conversational partner makes a choice to engage with me or not. Telepathy is the interpretation of subtle vibrational language, and I am just a radio transmitter. The spontaneity of hearing my Aramis's message was compelled by a prioritized desire to connect with him. That strong desire divined my Ami's station on the frequency dial. Telepathy is creative expression. Truly, telepathy is a creative process. Creative and artistic expression has always been a high priority in my life. Acting as one of my first artistic acting was one of my first artistic loves, and the experience of engaging in any extrasensory communication feels identical to the traditional creative process. I'm certain that everyone can relate to the feeling of being inspired and producing something from that special place. When something poetic flows from you and the only appropriate response is awe. Everyone is creative. Whether you're a painter or an accountant, you create. Extrasensory expression, intuitive and spiritual gifts, whatever you throw into that bag. I don't think of it as all so mystical. It's simply creative expression. A misstep in trying to understand intuitive spiritual work is to expect it to be scientific. It would be ludicrous to expect scientific results from a violinist performance of a concerto. Regimented precision isn't what we desire of the creative expression. The violinist can apply scientific focus in order to enhance her technical skill and more reliably execute her artistic gift, but an entirely technical performance would feel uninspired to any audience member. The artist must allow creative flow to be able to be in the realm of creative expression. This same process applies to one performing telepathy or other spiritual gifts. Therefore, I'm asking you to think of extrasensory spiritual gifts in exactly the same way you think of artistic gifts. Science is by its very nature linear and rule-driven. Now, if you were to try to force magic into a scientific framework, it just doesn't fit because it is chaotic and fluid. That quote is from author Genevieve Davis. Science and art work beautifully in hand. This is what I eventually learned from the veterinarian who told me he'll let you know. Great scientific advancements come from those moments of chaos and fluidity. Artist, the artist is better able to share her gifts when she has practiced accessing the source of creativity when she has applied linear focus to developing her techniques. Tibetan monks were more ex- who were more experienced at, at inducing the state of meditation that emits game br- gamma brain waves. Thus, telepathic communication as a creative process can be taught to humans as any other language. Considering we have used this language before, this process is actually one of relearning, and that's a lot easier than learning the nuts and bolts of a new foreign language. One may also consider that some people have more natural talent for telepathic communication just as one who may have more relative talent in languages or other artistic leanings. However, anyone can study and enhance skills of telepathy. The Animal and Nature Perspectives of Telepathy Now that we've looked at what telepathy is for the human, let's examine it from the animal's perspective. It's pretty simple. Animals always retain and consistently use telepathy. Therefore, when a human telepathically communicates with an animal, 
an expert is performing the other half of the conversation. Here's one example. Your dog gets super excited every time you pick up the leash, except for the times when you're taking him to the veterinarian. Instead of queuing up at the door, excited about an impending game of fetch, he runs and hides under the bed. You didn't even say the V-E-T word. How did he know? Well, just like a radio, you were broadcasting the information, and your dog knows how to listen to that frequency. I noticed that Aramis seemed to know that I was waking up, even before I myself knew. He slept at my feet or on my side, but every time my eyes opened, even if I were waking at an unpredictable hour, he was already there, poised at my face, mid-purr. Now, your dog may not run and hide every time you're planning a vet visit. Humans have 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day, so our animal companions do not, could not, listen to all of them. They need to spend some time with their own thoughts, too. I liken it to walking down a busy city street. You can't listen to all of the conversations, but some filter in, especially the ones that are interesting, proximate, or emotionally heightened. And if someone on the street were to say your name, you would automatically tune into what they have to say. Likewise, animals do overhear plenty and listen when you specifically address them. Well, rather, when you address them, they may hear you even if they don't always listen. (laughs) Like humans, animals have free will and ego, and so your companion may have a different opinion than you about what is important, such as going to the vet. Another reason animals are better with telepathy than our humans may be due to their spiritual practices. That's right. Animals have their own spiritual practices. It may seem to humans that the cat is spending his day lazing around, but some of that activity is actually a form of meditation and prayer. These practices would make them better at accessing that gamma brainwave state and that shared signal, as I like to call it. You'll read more about the spiritual lives of animals as you continue to read the stories ahead in this book. This book contains stories about my experiences communicating with animals and nature. To explain how nature communication works, I refer again to Deepak Deepak Chopra's quote, We are energy, and where there is energy, there is information. The concept of discerning messages from nature may be more challenging to accept since trees, flowers, rivers, etc., are considered less similar to humans than our animals. We think of these parts of our world as inanimate and or non-sentient. Rather than a statically defined statement, I think that sentience is relative and subjective, especially when we are considering less physical or, shall I say, spiritual aspects of the elements. To proceed through these pages, I invite you to suspend your disbelief, to put a pin in how you have understood and experienced nature thus far. You can always pick up back your previous understanding. Follow me down highway, fearless curiosity. If it helps, play make-believe with me so that you can relax and consider a new way to perceive the world around you. You may just experience a miracle. If quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Everything we call real is made up of things that cannot be regarded as real. Niels Bohr, physicist from 1885 to 1962. And that concludes my sharing of my book, Animals Are Who's To, What, Animal, what Animals Teach Me About Life, Love, and the Universe. Again, this is, this is still in process because a big part of it, of me finishing the book, is teaching my upcoming animal communication class. It's, come, it's actually starting next week, so you could go to my website and check it out. There's still time to register. And with that, I would love to go ahead and open up the phone lines, 323-524-2599. If anyone would like to ask a question about anything that we've been talking about here today, or if you would like some intuitive insight, I'm here for you. And so we do have a call, so I will take that caller now. Hi, you're on the air. Who's this? This is Darius. How are you? Darius? Oh, I know who you are. You have, I haven't talked to you in a long time. How are you? Yeah, it's been a while, yeah. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Great. What's going on with you? Well, I am wanting to know how I can enhance my intuitive services. Okay. Your services, so basically your business. Yes. Okay. Precisely. So you're looking for, you want to feel <laughs> more um, volume of business. Um, it feels like also, you kind of feel like, 
there's some kind of organization you're interested in too. I, I don't know if it's like somewhere between, I think it actually is both. Like you kind of are offering, you have a lot of things that you can offer. So you want to both enhance it, but also simplify it. Is that an experience you're having? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, I get it. Yes. I get it. I get it. Well, before, I, so I'm tapping into that intuitively and let me just see um, what Spirit has to say. Okay. So yeah, Spirit's saying that I can go ahead and share with you how I solved that problem for myself because I experienced, first of all, know that it's perfectly natural and normal because you are creative and, and intuitive as I've been talking about in this book. You know, it's the same process. And so the basically in the, the the developmental process of the human and also you know spiritually speaking it's something that we go through in cycles and cycles and cycles and so you're always going to be experiencing at one time or another that kind of big bomb and overwhelm of creativity and things that you can do and intuitive expression and all that kind of stuff so this is something it's really easy to kind of understand the process if you think about the chakra system the energy you know the energetic system the sacral chakra is the one that is the seat of the creativity. And so the sacral is the one that is saying, blah, all these ideas, ah, you know. And then the third eye is the one who actually can partner with sacral and see this, what I say, see the story in all of that creative expression. Basically, the third eye is a pattern seeker and will be able to organize and prioritize those things. And so... Until you kind of are starting to get a real grasp on that organization where, you know, like you say, I want to enhance it, know which one to do more of, and I don't want to lose any of it, actually. You can go ahead and just be general. And that's actually something that um, Abraham Hicks, she's always talking about going general, especially when you're feeling the overwhelm. So, Darius, you do have a lot to offer. And so I would say... With your, so far as your business is concerned, your offering is concerned, just make it general. Just call it something like intuitive counseling or intuitive readings or psychic readings, whichever ones of those words actually you align with right now. Or it doesn't have to be those words, but if you want to make it general, and then in your description, like on your website, you can list some of the things that may come in to that session. And because that's what you're going to do, you're going to hold yourself open to spirit and you're just going to bring through love right that's the most that's the only thing that's important in that session is that correct right yes okay so i think actually this organization will help you to feel a bit more grounded and will actually help you to what it's going to do is spirit showing me or giving me the feeling of it helps you to feel more professional even because right now you subtly have some conflicting vibration and so you as much as you want to do it and you love to do it the ways that you're kind of like not connecting on a broader scale is because of this, like this feeling of how organized am I? How professional am I? You know that you can do this, but you, but inside your conflicting frequency is some of that. So we'll work on that. You can do it on the physical level of just kind of going general and know that anything that you, that is a gift, anything that you can do, anything that you do, you're never going to lose it. So we don't have to capture all of the tigers by the tail today. We can because it's a gift, and you. The reason you have these gifts are to be able to help, and so of course they're gonna. You know, you're not gonna forget, and and also if we actually integrate them fully, we don't have to worry too much about explaining it to people because they'll feel it anyway. They'll just be connecting with it vibrationally. Does that make sense? It does. Makes perfect sense. Yes. Okay. Great. And hold on one sec. I'm gonna just feel. Um, so you and your vision, your your clairvoyance and your vision. I mean, I just see this powerful frequency, this um, expert. I mean, you feel, Dar- Darius, it's been a long time since we connected and you feel really different than what I remember feeling yeah, of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's awesome. And so I'm feeling you very much in the tuning of the third eye right now. And so that's that's a great place. So it's like teacher, it's visionary. And you're right there with the crown chakra. So the wisdom's coming through as well and so i think you're in an activated place like a uh in a broad sense that maybe even like this year or this the last six months is a very third eye time for you and that's fantastic so organized creativity that's really that's where you are and so just go be present and um I would say a little a little shifting of how you are on the physical with the website and everything presenting yourself. And then actually they're telling me that if you want to invest in some Facebook ads, that might help. Or 
Instagram, whichever one that you're on. So <laughs> you don't have to spend a ton of money on it, but it, okay. just to bump it up a little bit, that actually helps because we're working with social media to be able to promote our businesses and, you know, we want to give ourselves an edge in the algorithm. Does that, does that sound like you, something you could do? Yes, it cool. does indeed. Yeah. For sure. And definitely make some, maybe some video and stuff like that so people can connect with your energy, that kind of stuff. Are you doing YouTube? Right. I am doing YouTube, yes. I'm Perfect. in the process of about, to, about to be recording one, literally, literally like minutes away from doing a video right now. Okay, well, say hi to everyone for me. I'll let you do that. <laughs> and I'll have to check out your YouTube channel. I've never checked it out. I, I didn't. I, I haven't uh, caught on to your to your jam there on YouTube. So, um, yeah, like if you want to, I would love it if you would send me a link. Tell everyone how they can get in touch with you, your website and your YouTube channel, and then we'll we'll do a little work on it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for this, actually. Um, so, yes, I just have it. I called it psychicsrus.net, but I, again, I don't know if that's organized enough. And I'm not, I don't know if I'm in the process of changing the name, but at, at the current moment in time, the name is psychicsrus.net. The same name as the YouTube channel and Instagram, because I'm wanting to inform others of our innate psychic ability. So, I want to give readings, but also profess my desire to teach Love the ability that. to receive intuition, you know? Well, I think it's really good marketing-wise. The um, Just to be behind it, really, I'll tell you the one last thing, is it doesn't matter what choice we make. It doesn't matter what decision we make. It matters who we are when we make the decision. So if you can connect your heart to Psychics, Psychics R Us, then it'll be perfect. But I think it's really smart. Wow, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for calling, Darius. So nice to connect with you again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll go check out your YouTube channel. Have a great day. Thanks so much for calling. Thank you. Have a great day as well. Thank you. And with that, that is our show. We are out of time, but I so enjoyed this time with you. I hope that you found the the book interesting. I hope that it piqued some interest for you. I hope that you felt inspired to pursue whether it's telepathy or animal communication or just your spirituality in general in new ways. I know many people who listen are really advanced spiritual seekers. So I hope that you found something in there that serves you. And again, if you would like to check out the Animal Communication Program, it's trishacarcharm.com slash animal hyphen communication. And I will be putting up some meditations on that YouTube channel. And um, that's again, youtube.com slash trishacar. And until then, I will see you next week. We'll be broadcasting live again at 11 a.m. Pacific. You'll be able to call in. I have a really awesome guest. His name is Chris Hoffman. Oh, he's amazing. You're all going to fall in love with him. You're going to want to put him in your pocket and drive us in the other pocket, and then nobody's going to love me anymore because these boys are just outshining me with their gorgeous hearts. <laughs> so do ch tune in live or check us out on iTunes or any way that you get your podcast or on the YouTube channel. And so I will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. I love you, whoever you are. Thank you.